On July 18th, 2019, 28-year-old Andrew Harper scrawled a little note inside of a card, and then he folded the card up, he slipped it into its envelope, and he handed that envelope off to a nearby friend. And this friend, after getting this envelope and Andrew's directions for what to do with it, he left Andrew's room and began walking down the hall all the way towards the other side of the Ardington house. The Ardington house, where they were staying, is this beautiful mansion built in the 1700s that sits on about 30 30 acres of gardens and parklands, and it's located about an hour west of London in the English countryside. Once Andrew's friend, with this letter in hand, had walked all the way across the mansion and had found the room he was looking for, he gently knocked on the door, and then after being let inside, he made his way right over to 28-year-old Lissy Beckett, and he handed her the envelope. Lissy and Andrew had grown up in the same town of Wallingford, which is a small rural town about 10 miles away from where they were, the Ardington House. And from the time Lissy and Andrew had met each other when they were 15 years old, they had become totally inseparable. It was truly love at first sight. And now, 13 years later, they were finally getting married. And so Lissy, after getting this envelope, she saw the writing on the outside of it and knew it was from her fiance. And so she smiled, she opens up this letter and she reads what's inside. And it just said, life is slippery. Here, take my hand. While on the surface, this little note seemed like nothing more than a romantic gesture from Andrew, in reality, those seven words contained in that card were a great representation of who Andrew really was. He was a protector. Ever since Lizzie could remember, Andrew had always been so concerned with her safety. And for that matter, anybody around Andrew, Andrew was just worried about and wanted to make sure everybody was taken care of. And as Andrew got older and grew to be this massive six foot five inch tall man, his natural inclination to protect other people only became more pronounced. While Andrew was known for being incredibly charming and friendly and approachable, at a moment's notice, he could flip the switch and literally step in and use his big frame to protect anybody that needed protecting, no questions asked. And so it came as no shock to Lissy or really anybody who knew Andrew when Andrew, at the age of 19, became a special constable or volunteer police officer for the Timms Valley Police Department. This police department was the same one that that oversaw Wallingford, where he and Lissy had grown up, and also the surrounding areas. And just a year after becoming a special constable, Andrew had done such an amazing job that he was hired on by the Timms Valley Police Department to be a regular constable, so a full-fledged police officer. And over the following years that he was a regular constable, Andrew's hard work and dedication would quickly make him one of the most well-respected and well-liked police officers on the force. In fact, just a few weeks before he sent off that letter to Lissy on the day of their wedding, Andrew had been promoted. He had been assigned to the road policing unit within the Timms Valley Police Department. And what that meant was, in addition to a host of new responsibilities on a day-to-day -day basis, Andrew would now become one of the police officers who would immediately respond to any emergency call that came in. He was basically a front lines police officer now. And so, of course, this meant Andrew's job just became a lot more dangerous. But for Andrew, that didn't matter at all, because to him, the most important thing was protecting people in need. And so this promotion just gave him a bigger opportunity to do that. And so Lissy, after reading this little note that Andrew had just sent her, she set it down on the table and now with a big grin on her face, she finished getting ready. And then that afternoon, she and Andrew would walk down the aisle and they would say, I do, in front of their families and their closest friends. And then that evening, after the newlyweds had had their first dance as a married couple, they would tell each other that this was the happiest day of their lives. 28 days later, on August 15th, Andrew, along with his partner, who also was named Andrew, his name was Andrew Shaw, they were conducting a surveillance operation in a town called Reading. Reading is a town about 30 minutes south of Wallingford. Just after 11 p.m., the men finally decided it was time to shut down their operation and head back home. Their shift had actually ended four hours earlier, but being hardworking and diligent police officers, they had worked overtime because they knew it would help 
help their unit. But now at 11 p.m., they were totally exhausted. And so as they're kind of yawning and packing up their things, Shaw, who was driving, would fire up the engine of the unmarked BMW car they were in. And then once it was on, he would pull away from the curb and they would start heading north. At the same time, a very distressed man who lived not far from where Andrew and Shaw had just been doing surveillance, he called 999 and he told the dispatcher that just a few moments ago, this gray sedan had pulled up his driveway and stopped right outside of his property. Now, this man's property was off of a road called Admore Lane, which was this winding one lane country road that had very little traffic and there was not that many properties off of it. And so for anybody to pull on to this man's property would have caught his attention, let alone a car pulling onto his property in the middle of the night. And so as soon as the man had seen these headlights coming up his driveway, he had gone to the window and watched, wondering, you know, what is this person doing? Had they turned onto the wrong property? You know, are they going to turn around and leave? But to his horror, once this car had stopped right outside of his house, three masked men who were carrying weapons of some kind got out of the vehicle. And so at that point, the man had frantically dialed 999. And as he's trying to describe the situation to the dispatcher, he suddenly tells the dispatcher as he's looking out the window that he thinks these men are here to steal his quad bike. His quad bike was parked right outside of his detached garage and he saw them walking towards it. And so he tells the dispatcher, who's already told him that police are on the way, he tells the dispatcher, I can't wait any longer. I'm going out to confront them and stop them from stealing my bike. The dispatcher yells at him not to and says they have weapons. Stay in your house. But this guy's not listening. And so he runs to his front door. He opens the front door up. But by the time he's looking outside, the gray car, the three masked men, they're all gone. And so too is his quad bike. And so he goes back in the house. He's talking to the dispatcher and the dispatcher says, look, just stay at your house. The police are on the way. They will intercept that car. They'll get your quad bike back. And so seconds later, a call went out over the radio to Tim's Valley Police to go and intercept this gray car on Admore Lane. So whoever was closest, go over there. But be advised, the occupants of this car are three masked men that are armed and dangerous. Now, Andrew and Shaw, when they heard this call, they would have known that they were not the only officers that could have taken this call. And they also would have known that they've been off the clock now for like four and a half half hours. There was no expectation that they would continue to work and go take this call. But they didn't care at all. When that call came across, the only thing they thought about was, do your job. And so Shaw, he whips the car around and he speeds towards Admore Lane and he pulls off of the main road called the A4. He gets onto Admore Lane and he starts driving north. Now, as soon as they turned onto that road, their vehicle effectively blocked the way for anybody coming the other direction. And so at this point, they're expecting this gray car full of these masked men to be coming in their direction, and they are now blocking the way. And so Andrew and Shaw, as soon as they get on that road, they know a close quarters confrontation is almost guaranteed. But when you listen to the dash cam footage from the front of their vehicle that picked up the voices of Andrew and Shaw as they turn onto this road, there is no nerves, there's no fear, there's no hesitation. They are calm as can be. This is what they have trained for. They were ready. And so Shaw, he's making his way up this winding road. It's totally pitch black. The trees are practically on top of the road. It's like a tunnel of trees. And so they're driving along this road. And then all of a sudden, up in the distance, you can see on the dash cam footage, you see headlights bombing toward them. They're way off in the distance. And then all of a sudden, that car, these headlights, they come flooring out right in front of them. And both cars come to a screeching stop. You can hear the screeching of the brakes on the dash cam footage. And so this car in front of them comes comes to a full stop and Shaw, he stops, but then he moves up just a little bit closer before fully stopping the car. And so now the two cars are only maybe 10 or 15 feet apart. At this point, it's important to understand that the vehicle that Shaw and Andrew were in was an unmarked car and they had intentionally not put on their blue lights as they're cruising up this road because they didn't want the suspects to see the blue lights in the distance and turn around and get away. And so now they've come face to face. And so 
Andrew and Shaw, they're looking at this vehicle and they can see that one, it's a gray sedan. So it matches the description of the car they're looking for. And two, behind this gray sedan is what looks like a quad bike that they are towing. And so they know this is the car they were looking for. It's on Admore Lane. This is going to be it. And so Shaw, he flips on the blue lights and Andrew, who's in the passenger seat, he opens the door and begins yelling at the occupants to stay where they are. But they don't listen because now the masked men in the gray car, they know they've been caught. There's police right in front of them. And so suddenly one of the masked men in the back seat of this car, he leaps out of the vehicle and he runs around to the back of the gray car and he unhooks the quad bike. And then the gray car, without even waiting for this third masked man to get back inside, it just begins driving forward on the left side of Shaw and Andrew, basically trying to drive around them, despite the fact there's nowhere to drive. It's a ditch on either side of the road. But obviously, these guys are desperate and willing to do anything to get away. And so this gray car has driven down into this ditch before Andrew and Shaw could do anything. And then the third masked man, who's realizing he's being left behind, he starts running around the right side of the police car. So he's trying to go around the other way. And amazingly, as soon as the third masked man made it around to the back of the police car, the gray car somehow managed to pop out of the ditch and got back onto the road. And it starts driving away from Shaw and Andrew. And as they're driving away, the third masked man is just on the road running after them. And so Andrew, seeing an opportunity to potentially grab this third masked man that was out on foot, he jumps out of the police car, he turns and starts running down the road after the suspects. And so Shaw, he doesn't have enough space on this road to turn around and drive after them. And so all he could do was put the car into reverse and then look over his shoulder and start driving in reverse after them. And so as Shaw is driving backwards down this road, he can see out of his rear window, Andrew, who is chasing the third masked man who is chasing the gray car. And so we can see all this happening out his back window. And then something totally strange that just defied logic happened. The third masked man suddenly leaps as if he's trying to jump into the moving car. And at the same time, Andrew, who's closed the distance on him, kind of lunges for the third masked man. And then just as suddenly as these two maneuvers have happened, both men just vanish and then the gray car just drives away and disappears. And so Shaw, he's watching this happening and he has no idea what he's just witnessed. He's thinking, where did Andrew go? Where'd the third masked man go? What's happened? But he still can only drive in reverse. And so he's just driving and driving. And then finally, he reaches a point in the road that's just wide enough that he's able to turn the car around. And as he's doing that, you hear over dispatch that someone is asking Shaw, what's going on? Where are you? And all Shaw is able to say, is my partner, Andrew, has gotten out of the vehicle and I lost him. I don't know where he is. And so after Shaw has turned the vehicle around, he begins driving now facing the proper direction. And as he's driving down this creepy dark road, you don't see anything. It's eerily quiet. Andrew's nowhere to be found. The car is nowhere to be found. The third mass man, there's no one. And so Shaw is just driving down the road, hoping that as he makes one turn or the next, he's going to see his partner just kind of running on the road somewhere. But he doesn't. But as he's driving along, what Shaw didn't realize was that there were things in the road that belonged to Andrew. They were kind of small, so he didn't see them. But the footage would later reveal that it was almost like there was this trail of Andrew's things kind of littered all over the road. There was his wallet, then there was his badge, then there was his license and other ID cards, and then there was his glove, and then there was this piece of plastic that looked like it belonged on Andrew's vest. And then a little farther down the road, because Shaw is still driving, and scanning for his partner and scanning for anything and there's just nothing. As he's driving along, he would in real time notice something of Andrew's and it was Andrew's stab vest that he wore over his chest. And so he stops the vehicle and he gets out and again, he's on this totally pitch black road where it's weirdly quiet and he's walking up and he grabs the vest, he comes back into his vehicle and he puts it down inside of his car and at this point, over the radio, people are asking Shaw, you know, what's going on? Where are you? And you hear in Shaw Shaw's voice, a bit of panic as he's like, I've found Andrew's stab vest. It was on the side of the road and he can't make sense of that. He has no idea why it's there and dispatch. 
They don't know what to make of that. And so Shaw just continued driving down this road, thinking to himself, what's happening here? Meanwhile, less than a mile away at the end of Admore Lane, where it joined up with A4, which is where Andrew and Shaw had originally come in, two other Tim's Valley police cars had arrived at that intersection. They had gone there specifically to try to intercept this gray car as they fled. And so they're sitting at this intersection and they're looking up Admore Lane and they see headlights bombing towards them. It's the gray car and the gray car comes speeding out onto A4. It makes a hard turn and it speeds away from these two police cars. And so one of these two police cars that were waiting out on the A4, one of them takes off following the gray car. But the other police car, they stay right there because unbelievably, they had just spotted Andrew. It would turn out when Shaw first put the BMW into reverse and he began going in reverse towards his partner who was chasing the third masked man who was chasing the gray car. When he was doing that and he was watching out his back window and he saw the third masked man jump and then disappear and then Andrew disappeared, that was not a figment of his imagination. That really happened. The third masked man had attempted to jump into the moving vehicle and he had been successful. As for Andrew, why he suddenly vanished? The reason for that is truly horrific. The three masked men were 18-year-old Henry Long and 17-year-olds Albert Bowers and Jesse Cole. All three of them, prior to this night, had fairly extensive criminal records, and they proudly referred to themselves as career thieves, which basically just meant they spent all day and all night stealing from people. And so that night, they had gone out with the intention of stealing that man's quad bike. It's unclear how they knew he had a quad bike, but they definitely showed up prepared because they knew they would have to get onto his property and very quickly tow that bike out of there before the homeowner could stop them. And so they had attached this long, very thick rope to the back of their gray car. It was basically like this big loop of rope, almost like a lasso. And so when they pulled up onto that man's property, they backed up to the quad bike and they looped that stretch of rope over the handlebars of this quad bike. And then all three of them piled back into the gray car and they sped off with the quad bike in tow. But when they were on Admore Lane and came face to face with Andrew and Shaw and realized those are police officers and were caught, the third masked man, a.k.a. Jesse Cole, he hopped out of the gray car, he ran around to the back, and he unhooked the loop of rope from this quad bike, ditching the quad bike by the side of the road so that it would be easier for the gray car to make their getaway. And so once it was free, the gray car kind of took off without Jesse. And so Jesse ran around the cop car but Jesse would get back up to the side of the gray car and he would leap into the window. And as soon as he was inside and Henry, who was driving, he knew he was inside, so they're all good. Henry hit the gas and who was standing with both feet inside of that loop of rope dangling off the back of the gray car when the gray car suddenly accelerated? Andrew Harper. Andrew was swept off of his feet as the rope grabbed onto his legs, and so his head came back and smashed into the ground, and then he was dragged for 91 seconds at an average speed of 42 and a half miles per hour down Admore Lane. It was only after he had been dragged for over a mile, whipping violently side to side, smashing not only into the ground, but into trees and fence posts and shrubs, just getting destroyed on this road, that finally, when they pulled off of Admore Lane and got onto A4, that turn swung Andrew around and he smashed into a curb that dislodged him from the rope and sent him careening into traffic. At that point, one of those two police cars took off after the gray car in pursuit. But the other car, they saw Andrew as he was thrown off the back of the gray car and launched onto A4. Now, initially, they actually thought that the suspects were just hauling a dead deer behind them because it looked like a bloody deer carcass was dangling behind the car. But when they ran up to see what it was, they saw it was their colleague. It was Andrew. And so immediately they tried to save his life. But Andrew's injuries were catastrophic. He had been destroyed. And so Andrew Harper would die at 11.45 p.m. on the side of the A4, about 20 minutes after he and his partner had so selflessly agreed to go after this car, despite the fact they didn't have to. The three killers were arrested about one hour after Andrew had died. 
died. A police helicopter had spotted their car parked amongst some buildings about four miles away from where Andrew was found. During their trial, the three teens would say they had no idea that Andrew was attached to that tow rope as they sped down Admore Lane. This is despite the fact that the prosecution, they went out and recreated the exact scene that played out on Admore Lane. They used the same car, they used the same tow rope, and they used a very lifelike dummy that was the same size as Andrew Harper. It was six foot five, 200 pounds, and they strapped it on the back of the car and they drove the same mile stretch to see what it would be like to drive with Andrew attached to the back. And these experts that went through this recreation over and over and over again, they said the same thing. It was nearly impossible to drive the car because as soon as the dummy would start to shift one way or the other, it would tug and pull on this little gray car. And so handling this car would have been a nightmare, not to mention the fact that the sound of Andrew grinding against the cement and smashing into trees and posts would have been extremely loud. And so the prosecution attested that there was absolutely no way that those three teens wouldn't have known that there was a person connected to the back of their car. Also, the prosecution said that all along Admore Lane, they found blood on both sides of the road, high up into bushes and on trees, indicating that as Henry had driven along with Andrew behind him, he must have been swerving violently side to side, most likely, at least according to the prosecution, to try to dislodge the person that was stuck on the back of his car. But the three teens never changed their story. They also never once said they regretted what they did. They showed absolutely no remorse. And when the verdict was read and these three teens were not found guilty of murder, they were found guilty of manslaughter, but everybody knew that was significantly better because the sentences were so much shorter. When that verdict came back, these three teens were punching the air and cheering and laughing, just making a complete spectacle out of it. And then after being led out of the courthouse with the devastated family of Andrew Harper basically watching them, they were smirking and smiling at the cameras and waving and just treating the whole thing like it was one big joke. Still to this day, none of them have apologized or expressed any regret or remorse about what happened. In fact, two of the killers, Jesse and Albert, they've come out publicly and said they're going to write a book about this crime, about killing Andrew Harper, and there's no indication that this book is being written because because they feel bad. It's almost certainly being written because it's an opportunity to make money. Following the verdict, Andrew's wife, Lissy, who was totally devastated, not only by the loss of her husband, but also by what she viewed as total injustice with regards to the fact that these three killers had not been convicted of murder. She would go on to lobby for years to pass a brand new law called Harper's Law that would give an automatic life sentence to any criminal that killed an emergency worker while they were committing a crime, meaning this law would not differentiate between whether it was manslaughter or murder. If you killed an emergency worker while committing a crime, you're going to jail for life. And this year, Harper's Law was passed. However, it will have no effect on the sentences of Andrew Harper's killers. Henry would be sentenced to 16 years in prison, and the other two, Albert and Jesse, would be sentenced to 13 years in prison each. All three of them will be eligible for parole by the time they are 28 years old, which is the same age that Andrew was when they killed him. At around 9 p.m. on March 3, 2022, a 31-year-old woman named Corey Richens tucked her three young sons into their beds and then headed downstairs to her kitchen inside of her luxurious home in suburban Utah. Once she got down to the kitchen, she yelled out for her husband, whose name was Eric, to come join her in the kitchen. Corey had some big news that she had just learned that day, and now that their kids were all tucked away in their beds and were off to sleep, she and her husband could celebrate this big news and share a drink together. A moment later, Eric walked into the kitchen, and Corey grinned at him and handed him his drink and then gestured for them to go upstairs to their bedroom. And so the two of them went upstairs, they sat down on the bed, and then Corey broke the big news. Corey's tiny real estate company had just found out that day that they were very likely going to close on a deal for this gorgeous 20,000 square foot mansion in Utah for $2 million. Now, Corey knew once she bought this property, 
property, she could do a couple of renovations to it and then quickly sell it for $3 million, meaning she was about to make a $1 million profit. Corey had been working really hard on her real estate business for years, but this really represented the first big break. She and Eric lived in a very conservative part of Utah, where it was kind of expected that someone like Corey would stay home with the kids and be a good housewife, and that would be her life. But Corey didn't really want that. She wanted to have a professional career that was kind of on par with her husband's. Eric ran a very profitable masonry company that allowed the family to take vacations to Mexico and Spain every year, and also to afford their sprawling property at the end of the cul-de-sac. Corey had stayed home when the three boys were much younger, but now that they were five, seven, and nine years old, they had decided to hire a nanny, which had allowed Corey to finally go out and pursue her professional dreams. And so totally beaming with pride, Corey sat there on the bed and clinked her husband's glass and went over all the details of this deal and talked about how great their lives were about to become with all this additional income. But fairly quickly, both of them decided they were too tired to stay up and celebrate any longer, especially Eric, who earlier that day had gotten an allergy shot and it had totally knocked him out. He was feeling kind of weak and tired. And so the two of them decided to just go to bed. And so after brushing their teeth and changing, they got into their bed they turned off the light and they were about to lay down and go to sleep when they heard their seven-year-old crying in his bedroom. And both parents let out a groan. And then Corey, she stood up indicating she would handle this because they knew often their seven-year-old would have nightmares and the only way he would go back to sleep was if his mom laid with him. And so Corey, she kissed Eric. And then as Eric rolled over to go to bed, Corey walked out of the room. She went down the hall, went into her son's bedroom. She got under the covers. And then before long, she and her son had fallen asleep. A few hours later, Corey suddenly sat up inside of her son's bed. It was about 3 a.m., and for a second, she couldn't even figure out where she was. The house was silent, it was totally dark, and she was confused, but then she remembered she had gotten up to tend to her son, and so she checked on her son, she saw he was still sleeping, and so she climbed out of the bed, she tucked him back in, she gave him a kiss, and then she left his room, went down the hall, and went back into her bedroom, where she climbed into her bed. Then she saw that Eric had kicked off all the covers, and he was sleeping on his back. And so Corey laid down on the bed and kind of rolled up right against her husband and she pulled the covers up over both of them and then she closed her eyes to go to sleep. But right as she did that, she noticed something very strange. Eric's body felt freezing cold. Corey opened her eyes and sat up in bed. She turned over and kind of pushed Eric to see if he would sit up and figure out why he was so cold. But Eric didn't budge. And when she pushed him, he felt really heavy, like dead weight. And so suddenly starting to panic, Corey yelled Eric's name several times, but Eric didn't budge. And so Corey leapt from the bed. She grabbed her phone and she dialed 911. And when the dispatcher picked up, Corey was so hysterical as she's looking at her husband lying motionless in his bed that she could barely tell the dispatcher what was going on. But finally, she did get it out to the dispatcher, and the dispatcher said, stay calm, the ambulance will be there as soon as we can. And so just moments later, Corey heard the sirens outside, and so she ran downstairs, she flung the door open, and practically cried with relief as the paramedics charged into the house. But when the paramedics got upstairs into the bedroom and they went to go revive Eric. They saw right away. It was already too late. Eric was dead. First responders had no idea what killed Eric. He seemed like a really healthy, fit guy who actually just the day before had gone for a casual eight mile run. And he was also this big outdoorsman, always going on hikes and going on these long hunts. And so the idea that this guy had just suddenly died seemed really suspicious. The police did find a painkiller pill bottle on the bedside table next to Eric's side of the bed. And for a second, they thought, well, you know, maybe he overdosed on painkillers. But when they looked at the label on this pill bottle, it was immediately clear that this was a really old pill bottle and almost certainly had been empty for some time. When they asked Corey what she thought might have happened, she was totally in shock, but she did say, you know, I, I don't know, I have no idea what happened to him, but, you know, the day before, he did get that allergy shot, and he had a kind of adverse reaction to it, and really wanted to go to bed quite early, which seemed odd. But both Corey and the first responders agreed that it seemed pretty far-fetched that an allergy shot would lead to Eric's death. 
suicide was also considered a possibility by first responders. But Eric really didn't have any reason to want to harm himself. He was a very devoted and loving father who adored his sons. He coached all their sports teams and went on all these adventures with them and was always out back kicking a soccer ball around with them. And his business was booming and he had just learned that night that his wife's business was potentially going to start booming as well. And so ultimately, the police told Corey that we're just going to have to open an investigation and try to figure out what happened and we'll be in touch. And if you think of anything that might help the investigation, please let us know. And Corey said, of course, I'll tell you, but she really wasn't listening. All she was thinking about was her three sons who were still sleeping in their beds and had no idea their dad was now gone. Over the next few weeks, while the family waited for autopsy results, Corey really focused her energy on her three boys who were really hit hard by the loss of their dad. Eric had been such a hands-on father that his absence was enormous in these boys' lives. The five-year-old kept asking, where's dad and when can I see him again? The older two boys, who did sort of understand that their dad was dead, would also ask questions like, well, can dad still see us or can dad still hear us? And these questions broke Corey's heart because she did not have an adequate answer to any of them. And so she tried to find a children's book online and in bookstores that dealt with grief in hopes that that would kind of help her sons deal with what they were going through. But none of the books she got helped at all. And so, a few weeks after Eric's death, when still nobody knew anything about how Eric died or what had really happened, Corey decided that she would take a different approach to helping her sons grieve. Instead of trying to read a book that somebody else wrote about how to handle grief, Corey just called her sons around one night and began telling them a story about their dad. And as she told them this kind of made-up story about their dad being this angel that was taking care of them, she began drawing pictures with a crayon and paper of their dad with wings and a halo. And she'd draw the kids down below waving up at their dad. And she would tell the boys that your dad is an angel now and he's looking down on you and he can hear you and he loves you. And this really seemed to work for the boys. It was like for the first time since his his passing that the boys kind of connected with the fact that their dad was gone, but they still had this meaningful connection with him. And so very quickly, Corey's stories about their dad and the illustrations that would go with them became a ritual. Every night, Corey would tell these stories and draw these pictures. And so as the days and weeks went by, with still no word and no closure about what happened to their dad, Corey had a sort of epiphany. These stories Corey told her kids about their dad and how now he was this angel looking out for them, she could see firsthand how powerful it was and how really it was helping her sons cope with this loss. And she thought, you know, why don't we turn our stories and all these illustrations into an actual grief book for kids? That way other families whose children are dealing with loss can read these stories as well and find some comfort. After all, Corey knew firsthand there really weren't any any good grief books on the market. And so she knew for those that needed this, this would be huge. On April 13th, so six weeks after Eric had died and several weeks after Corey and her kids had begun officially writing this kid's grief book, Corey was backing out of her driveway when from the other end of the cul-de-sac, she saw a police car coming down the way and it was the lead detective on Eric's case, Detective Woody. It amazes me how many people tell me they have binge watched all 300 plus of our YouTube episodes and now they wait anxiously every single week for new strange, dark and mysterious content. And while this is totally awesome and very flattering, I usually respond with, well, don't you know we have another library of strange, dark and mysterious content outside of YouTube that can be consumed anytime you want? As of this moment, there are over 140 strange, dark and mysterious tales on our podcast, the Mr. Ballin podcast. We release two episodes every single week. On Mondays, it's brand new content exclusive to the podcast. And then on Thursdays, we upload remastered versions of our best YouTube stories. You can listen to the Mr. Ballin podcast available exclusively on Amazon Music with your Prime membership. If you're not a Prime member, you can still listen to the Mr. Ballin podcast by subscribing to Amazon Music Unlimited in the Amazon Music app. Thank you. 
as the detective came down the road, he was waving to Corey, clearly getting her to stop for a second. And so Corey, she parked her car, she hopped outside and went up to talk to him. And immediately, Detective Woody got out of his car, he walked up to Corey, and with a grave look on his face, he told her that he had some big news for her and it was going to be pretty upsetting, but he knew he had to tell her in person and right away. He told her that the autopsy results were in, and they determined that Eric had not died of natural causes. He had actually died from a fentanyl overdose. Fentanyl is a very powerful opioid that's often mixed with heroin, and just a little bit of fentanyl can kill someone. And Eric, it would turn out, had five times the lethal dose of fentanyl in his system. Corey was totally shocked at this news and told the detective that Eric didn't do drugs. The only drug he did was periodically he would eat a marijuana gummy before bed, but that was it. So this really didn't make any sense. The detective was respectful and kind of nodded his head and said, I totally understand that, but you know, these are the results and we need to find out where he got fentanyl from. And so we're going to need to search all of the electronic devices in your house to see if we can find communication between your husband and whoever got him the fentanyl. Corey told the detective that of course they could do that. But as she began thinking about all of their devices, she suddenly remembered that Eric's business partner, Cody Wright, had actually taken Eric's laptop very shortly after Eric had passed away. Now, Corey didn't know why Cody had taken the laptop, but Cody had been a thorn in both Corey and Eric's side for several years now. Eric and Cody had been very close friends when they had started their masonry business together about a decade earlier, but they'd had a serious falling out a few years back. The two men had been on this elk hunting trip, and at one point Eric had illegally shot and killed a bull elk, and Cody had actually reported Eric after this hunting trip to the game wardens. And as a result, Eric got in a lot of trouble and was temporarily banned from hunting anywhere in Utah. The two men still managed to continue to work together and build their masonry business, but it was very clear their relationship was totally fractured and would never be repaired. Now, Corey didn't get into all the details of the tensions with Cody, but she did tell Detective Woody that, you know, if you want access to Eric's laptop, you got to go talk to Cody because he took it for some reason. And also, you really just ought to talk to Cody in general because, you know, maybe he has more to do with what happened to Eric and this whole fentanyl thing than he's letting on. The detective told Corey that he appreciated the information and he appreciated being allowed to go in and collect all the devices and that he would go talk to Cody and try to retrieve Eric's laptop. And then after that, the detective thanked Corey and said they'd be in touch soon. But after this conversation with Corey, the investigation into Eric's death kind of stalled out. When police did follow up with Cody, they didn't find anything really worth pursuing. And outside of talking to Cody, no new information came in about Eric's death or about, you know, his connection to fentanyl. And so really there was nothing for police to operate on. And so while the family just kind of waited for more information to come out about whatever happened to Eric, Corey just focused her energy on taking care of her three boys and writing this grief book with them. And finally, on March 5th, 2023, so almost exactly a year after Eric has died, and still police have no idea what happened to him, the grief book was finally done, and Corey self-published it on Amazon under the title, Are You With Me? And right away, the book was a total hit with parents of grieving children. And as the five-star reviews poured in, so too did requests from local media for Corey to be interviewed and talk about this book and why she wrote it and how her kids are doing. Corey had no idea her book would be this successful. And so at first she was really terrified to do any of these interviews, but eventually she decided she would just say yes to all the interviews because she was very proud of what her and her kids had created. And she knew Eric would be proud too. However, what Corey didn't know was there was going to be a massive unintended consequence from publishing this book. 
Ever since Eric was found dead in 2022, the police in Utah began painstakingly searching all of the electronic devices that the Richens owned and that Cody, Eric's business partner, owned. And basically, they were just looking anywhere for some sign of communication between Eric and whoever had given him the lethal fentanyl dose. And at some point during the search of all these devices, the police found something very unusual. And they knew it very likely had to do with Eric's death. But they didn't really have any evidence to prove that. And so they just had to kind of sit on it and wait to see what happened next. And what happened next was shortly after Corey published her grief book, it got all this media attention. And in turn, because of this attention, Eric's death, specifically the unsolved nature of his death, also got a lot of media attention. And eventually, several people who kept seeing all this news about Eric's unsolved death reached out to police and said, you know what? He did not overdose on fentanyl. He was murdered, and I'm almost positive I know who did it. And lo and behold, the alleged killer that all these people brought up to the police was the same person that the police in Utah had become suspicious of because of all those unusual things they had found during their search of all of the electronic devices. And so on May 8th, 2023, not long after getting all these tips about this alleged killer, the police in Utah felt like they finally had enough ammo to go after this person and they headed out to make an arrest. While we don't know for sure what happened, because again, this story, it's ongoing. This case has not even gone to trial yet. Here is what prosecutors say really happened to Eric Richens on March 3rd, 2022, the night he died. That night, Eric was upstairs when he heard Corey down in the kitchen calling for him, saying to come down and join her. And so he went downstairs, he went into the kitchen, and immediately he saw his wife grinning ear to ear, and she promptly handed him a drink and said, I have big news and we're going to celebrate. And after the two of them went up to their bedroom, Corey told Eric all about this big real estate deal and how their company was about to profit a million dollars. And then after that, they clinked their glasses together, said cheers, and took a sip from their cups. The drink that Corey made for both of them was called a Moscow Mule. It's made with ginger beer, vodka, and lime. But when Corey mixed Eric's Moscow Mule, she added one additional ingredient, a lethal dose of fentanyl. It would turn out Corey had been stealing money from Eric's bank accounts, and he had found out. Eric also had discovered that Corey had been taking out these massive loans in their family's name, which Eric was really upset about. In fact, Eric was so upset with Corey that he wanted a divorce and was talking to a divorce lawyer and making sure after the divorce was finalized that Corey could not touch his money. But perhaps sensing that a divorce was imminent and the money faucet would be turned off, Corey simply took out a $2 million policy on Eric and then killed him. And then shortly after that, in order to help her sons deal with the loss of their father, who she killed, she wrote a grief book about it and sold it for a profit. Police say Corey had been working for weeks to figure out the right fentanyl dose to give to her husband. On Valentine's Day that year, Corey had given Eric a poisoned sandwich that had fentanyl in it that she attached a love note to, but it obviously did not kill Eric. He just broke out in hives. So Corey got a stronger dose of fentanyl. She put it in his drink on March 3rd, and this time it worked. The story that Corey told first responders when they arrived to hopefully try to save Eric was that, you know, they had had the celebratory drink and then they went to bed and then she had gotten up to see her son. And then, you know, when she came back at 3 a.m., Eric was cold to the touch and she called 911. But in reality, after she poisoned her husband and he's laying there still on the bed, slowly dying from this overdose, she just got up and paced around the house for several hours, Googling things like how to destroy electronic evidence and luxury prisons for the rich in America. These searches were, of course, the highly unusual and suspicious things that the police saw when they looked through all those devices during the initial part of the search. But as much as it made them think Corey likely had something to do with this, they didn't have enough to actually arrest her. 
However, after Corey published her grief book and went on this big tour promoting her grief book, Eric's family, who's watching this happen on TV and listening to the radios, I mean, they just couldn't take it. It disgusted them because they secretly believed that Corey had killed Eric over money. They didn't like Corey to begin with, and it just felt like she did this, and now she's profiting on Eric's death. And so family members began reaching out to police in Utah, and they said, you really need to look into Corey. We think she killed Eric. This whole grief book thing is a joke. She's a killer. Ultimately, it was those calls from Eric's family to the police, combined with Corey's very unusual and suspicious search history and electronic activity on the night that Eric died, that allowed police to arrest her at her home on May 8th, 2023. Corey, who denies any wrongdoing and says she did not kill her husband, is currently charged with aggravated murder, which could lead to the death penalty if she's convicted. She's being held without bail while she awaits trial, and her book, Are You With Me?, is no longer being sold on Amazon. On April 18th, 1999, police entered Christopher Case's apartment and they discovered his body. The coroner came in and was able to determine in relative short order that Christopher had died of natural causes. But when friends and family got a hold of the coroner's report, they turned to the police and they were like, wait, have you not heard what was happening to Chris in the week leading up to his death? And so police began interviewing the friends and family of Christopher Case and they unraveled this totally insane story that to this day baffles investigators. Christopher Case predicted his own death. But before we get started, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all I do. And I upload at least three to four times a week. And I'm actually trying to get to five times a week. So I'm all in on this thing. And if that's what you're into, then please, if you would, gently slap the like button and then subscribe to my channel and turn on all post notifications so you don't miss any of those weekly uploads. All right, let's get into the story. By early 1999, Christopher Case was living his best life. He was 35 years old, he had moved out to Seattle to pursue a career in music, and he had landed a job at a music company in Seattle, and he had risen to the rank of executive at that company. He was incredibly fit, you know, he was known for being at the gym seven days a week, you know, he took vitamins, he took his health very seriously, he had loads of friends, people really liked him, he was very close with his family. And, you know, despite all that, despite his popularity and success, he had been single for years. And even though he was not actively seeking a, a companion, his friends and family were continuously trying to set him up on dates. But Chris would prefer to not go on a date and actually stay home by himself and listen to music because Chris had an obsession with a very specific type of music. He loved music from ancient times, specifically from Egypt. And so he would stay home instead of go out on dates and, you know, crush ancient Egyptian music. That was like his idea of a great night. On April 11th of 1999, Chris was on a business trip because part of his job required a ton of travel. And he was on a trip with a couple of his coworkers um, who were also friends of his. They go out to San Francisco and on the 11th, they decide to go out for dinner that night. And one of his coworkers decides to bring along a friend who was someone that lived in the area. So they get to dinner and one of them has their friend who's a, an older woman, very attractive, very kind of intense looking woman. Uh, she was about 20 years older than Chris. That was his guest. And she sits down and the, and the four of them are just kind of having a nice conversation. And at some point, the older woman really takes an interest in Chris. And Chris takes an interest in her because it would turn out that they had a lot in common. And then she actually admitted to him that she was really into music from ancient times and actually has a a specific interest in music from ancient Egypt. And so to Chris, he's like, how can this be? And he's like, this is my, my passion. I love that type of music. And they really hit it off. Now, Chris was not looking for any sort of romantic involvement with this woman. He was just so excited to talk about something he loved. And so all night, 
Chris and this older woman are chatting it up and they're super into each other. He was looking at her purely from a platonic sense, but it was becoming clear by the end of the night, at least Chris was realizing this, that she was looking at him with a romantic angle. She was interested in Chris. And in fact, right as he's kind of realizing this, she asks him if, if he wants to leave with her and go back to, to her place. And he politely declines because he's, he's not interested. He, he loved chatting with her about music and other, other things they had in common, but he wasn't interested in her romantically. And she became a little bit more aggressive and said, no, come on, come on, let's get out of here. I got a place right down the road. We can go listen to music and hang out in my place. And he felt really uncomfortable and he kept saying no, but she wouldn't let it go. And so finally, as she's literally trying to get him to say yes, he says, hey, you know what? I, I've had a long night. I'm going to go. And so he stands up to leave and the woman goes from being very flirtatious and friendly to very angry at Chris. And she looks at him and kind of abruptly says to him, I'm actually a witch and I'm going to put a curse on you. You're going to be dead within a week. Okay. And he just leaves. So the next morning on April 12th, Chris gets up and he heads to the airport and he flies back to Seattle. When he lands in Seattle, he calls his friend Sammy, who was one of his very close friends uh, back when he lived on the East Coast. He just wanted to share this weird experience with a close friend. And so they're kind of laughing about the whole thing. Neither of them are taking the curse seriously at all. It was like, you really dodged a bullet. It's good you did not go home with her. So in good spirits, Chris hangs up the phone with Sammy. And for the next 24 hours, Chris would fall right back into his regular daily life in Seattle. Uh, nothing out of the ordinary happened. But all that would change starting the night of April 13th, which would have been 48 hours after his encounter with this woman in San Francisco. So Chris lives alone. He doesn't have pets. And he gets into bed that night and he's laying there and before he falls asleep, he hears whispering coming from outside of his bedroom in the kitchen area, kind of near the front door. And he's thinking to himself, like, I didn't just hear whispering. Like, what? No one's in here. What's going on? And he's, he's hearing the whispering and then it kind of stops. And before he gets up to investigate, he's like, okay, I probably was just hearing things that that wasn't real. And he's just kind of laying there trying to go to sleep. And then he hears it again. Except now it's not coming from the kitchen area. It's coming from a separate area in his apartment outside of the, the room he's in. And so now he's wondering, like, is someone, did someone sneak into my house? Like, is there a burglar in my house right now? And so he quietly gets out of his bed and he walks over to his door. He opens it up and he can still hear the whispering. And it's coming from like his laundry room a little ways away. But as soon as he opens the door and he pokes his head out, the whispering stops. And he's just standing there like looking around, like hoping that there isn't anything in his apartment. And then out of the corner of his eye, near the front door, he sees something dash across his periphery, like a shadowy figure basically darts across the room. And so he looks over and he's, he's immediately afraid that it really is a burglar in his room. And as he's looking, he's turning the light on next to him. He's looking around and he starts hearing the whispering again. And now it's coming from another section of his house. So he just starts turning on all the lights and looking around to try to like make sure no one's in his apartment. He's kind of, he's not even thinking about the whispering. He's just looking for the shadowy figure that he saw run past him. And so he's looking all over his apartment. All the lights are on. It's a small apartment. And as soon as he feels comfortable that the door is locked still, everything's locked and there's nobody here, that's when he realizes that that whispering is still happening. And so he turns back around and now the whispering is coming from his bedroom where he was. And so he walks over to his bedroom and looks inside and he just, he can't pinpoint the whispering. Like he keeps hearing it and walking to wherever it's coming from. And as soon as he gets near it, the whispering stops. And he's thinking to himself, like, am I dreaming? Is this a dream? Am I losing my mind? Did, did somebody slip me something like last night? Like, is what's wrong with me? So he has this horrible night where he's up all night chasing down whispers in his apartment that keep vanishing and then seeing shadowy figures running around and lurking in corners but he can't ever see them when he looks at them and so the next morning on april 14th when you know the sun comes up he hasn't slept the first phone call he makes is to sammy his friend and he's totally panicked and we know about this phone call because sammy would tell police about all her interactions with with chris over the course of this week she would say that he was totally panicked and she even thought as she's taking this phone call that it's just so weird, you know, that Chris is scared of noises in his apartment and like figures moving around in his apartment because it's so unlike Chris. He's, I mean, 
definitely a skeptic. He's just like a, he's a no BS kind of guy. So the idea that he would suddenly be terrified of something paranormal running around his apartment just seems so unlike him. But as she's listening to him, he was so scared about what was in his apartment. He knew it wasn't a person because he looked everywhere. There was no people. And that's the only reason he didn't call the police is because he didn't want to tell the police that some shadow figure that's whispering in my apartment is harassing me. Like, what are the police going to do? So Sammy hangs up the phone with Chris after trying to reassure him and just hopes that whatever that was doesn't happen again. But unfortunately for Chris, the night of the 14th now, he's going to bed again and he starts hearing the whispers and immediately he's out there looking, lights on. He's looking for these whispers. They keep disappearing. He can't find the source. He's getting frustrated. He's scared. He keeps seeing that thing dart around his apartment. Except this night, he also noticed that he would look and he could get close enough to where he could break out the silhouette of what looked like a person, you know, like lingering in the corner of his apartment, but he'd go closer to it and it would disappear. It was like the manifestations of what he was seeing, the whispers and this figure running around his apartment were becoming more vivid. But he's also thinking like, I didn't sleep the night before. This could be my imagination. Like, I don't know if this is happening, but he's spiraling and he knows it. So the next day on the 15th, he doesn't call Sammy, but he calls a couple of his other friends that are anonymous and they would all tell police that they got a similar story that Sammy had gotten that first night after the 14th. No matter what was happening, Chris believed it was happening and Chris was terrified, but this wasn't even the worst of it yet. So that night on the 15th, Chris gets in bed and now he's barely slept for two consecutive nights and he's determined to just go to sleep. That he, he's trying to tell himself that everything that you've experienced the past couple nights is probably brought on by stress. It's brought on by now certainly a lack of sleep. So he's telling himself like, just, just go to sleep. Just get in bed and go to sleep. So he gets in bed and he's laying there and he does fall asleep. But he wakes up in the middle of the night and he can't move his body. He's, he's paralyzed, he can't move and he's totally awake. And he starts hearing whispering. And now his level of fear is so high because now he's immobile. But the past two nights he's heard that whispering in his apartment and he's seen that, that figure moving around his apartment. And so he's, he's laying there in darkness because he went to bed in darkness and he starts hearing whispering outside his room and then it stops. And then he starts hearing whispering inside of his closet and then it stops. And then he hears whispering right underneath his bed and he can't move. And he's just laying there praying that nothing horrible is going to happen to him, that this is just a dream. And then out from underneath his bed, right next to him, he can only turn his eyes. This black figure, this shadowy black figure emerges right next to his bed. And it's looking down at him. He can't make out any facial expressions, but he can clearly define, you know, a figure is hovering over him. And it reaches down and puts its hands around his neck and begins to throttle him. And Chris is like gagging. He can't breathe, but he can't move. And at some point, the thing begins to lift him off of his bed by his neck and then throws him back down. And then the figure vanishes. Chris still couldn't move. He's choking to breathe, but he can't move. And he's just waiting for this thing to come back. And he knows that more than likely, whatever this is, is probably going to kill him this night. So he's laying there just thinking, oh my God, I'm about to die. I'm about to die. But the thing doesn't come back and Chris can't move. And at some point, Chris, probably out of just pure, you know, adrenaline crash or something, he falls asleep. And so when Chris wakes up and he can move again, he notices there's blood inside of his bed on his sheets. And then he looks at his hands and at the tips of all 10 fingers are these incisions. Like someone had intentionally cut open the top of every finger, something he certainly didn't do. And his bed is covered in blood from these 10 cuts on his hands. And then he feels his neck and it feels tender. And it turns out he had marks on his neck. It was all bruised up from this thing choking him out. And it brought him back to like, that really happened. He's now like actually in fear for his life. Chris immediately calls Sammy and tells Sammy everything that happened. And Sammy can't believe any of it. She's, she felt helpless because she's on the other side of the country. She can't help him. And Chris is just petrified. And he's like, he can barely speak, you know, he's like unable to articulate what's happening. You know, he's, he's describing these cuts on his hand and his neck, but there's no one in his apartment. And Sammy's trying to get him to call the police, but Chris is like, I can't call the police. What am I going to tell him? That a shadowy figure is coming in my apartment and, and choking me? They're going to think I'm crazy. Chris decides 
he's going to approach this head on. Maybe that woman in San Francisco did put some curse on me. I need to at least research it. And so there was a religious bookstore right near his house that he figured might have some things on demonic possession and demons, the occult. And he goes in there and he kind of awkwardly approaches the, the store owner and is like, I'm looking for, you know, books about demons and, and witchcraft and like how to protect yourself against that. And the guy points him towards a section of the store. And so Chris goes over there, he scoops up a whole bunch of books. He also buys like a whole bundle of crucifixes. So like at least 10. So he's got all these crucifixes. He's got all these books about demonic possession and witchcraft. He buys all of that and he leaves and he goes back to his apartment. When he gets back after doing some research, he ends up putting these crucifixes all over his apartment, like every room. And he takes salt and he draws a line all through his apartment against the baseboard of every wall in the house. And at every corner of the house, he'd pile up little little piles of salt. He was gonna do all the things that people say to do if you're dealing with demons or ghosts or anything through witchcraft. He was kind of grasping at straws a little bit. So he went out and did everything he thought he could possibly do to protect himself. That night, which was April 16th, we don't know what happened to Chris, but something scared him so badly then in the middle of the night, in a full panic, he runs out of his apartment and he checks into a hotel and does not stay at his apartment. The next morning, April 17th, when Sammy called Chris to check on him. Now remember, this is 1999. There was just landline phones. So she calls his landline at his, at his apartment to check on him. There's no answer because he's not there. He's at the hotel. And Sammy, who's been speaking to Chris and other friends that have been speaking to Chris, and everyone's concerned about his mental health and what's going on with him. When she doesn't get Chris to pick up his phone, she calls the police and she says, hey, I'm concerned about my friend. Can you do a welfare check on this guy? And they go over to his apartment and it's locked and they kind of look in the windows and everything just seems kind of quiet. And so they leave and they tell Sammy like, hey, look, it's locked. We can't really do anything. Um, you know, let us know if you don't hear from him in the next couple of days. And so that was it. And so Sammy's like super concerned. And so she goes to work on the 17th. And then when she gets back, she has a voicemail from Chris, who had called her at some point during the day while she was out. And on the voicemail, Chris tells her in a voice that was different than the past few days. The past few days, he was scared. He was really scared. This time, he is defeated. You know, he was like resigned to whatever was going on. And he says to Sammy on the voicemail, he's under attack. And that tonight, they're going to kill me. And there's nothing I can do. As soon as she's done listening to the message, Sammy calls Chris, but she can't get in touch with him. She knows she just talked to the police who were there at his apartment that day. They're probably just going to tell her like, hey, wait until tomorrow. We just told you, you know, earlier, just give it a couple days. And so she just decides that she's going to go to bed and she's going to try calling him again on April 18th. On the morning of April 18th, Chris didn't show up for work. And word got back to Sammy, who was already going to reach out to Chris that morning anyways. But, you know, the friends and family are talking about what's going on with Chris. And so word got back to her that Chris had missed work. And so she calls Chris. He's not picking up from his landline. And now she calls the police back and she says, hey, you were there yesterday. I know it was locked, but he hasn't shown up for work today. Everybody's concerned about him. Can you please go over and check? And so the police go back over to Chris's apartment. And this time the front door is unlocked and they go inside and they're met with this very strange scene. You know, you have all these crucifixes that are on the wall. You have the salt that lines every room in the house. There are all these candles that have burned down to the wick. Um, there are little scraps of paper all over the, all over the apartment that were handwritten little messages that Chris was leaving all over the house, uh, warding off spirits and demons. I mean, it just looked like out of a Hollywood set for some demonic movie or something. And they search the house and there's no sign of Chris. They're yelling for him. There's no sign of him. And they make their way into the bathroom where they discover Chris's body. Chris was in his bathtub, no water in the bathtub. He's fully clothed. There's all these candles all around the outside of this bathtub. There's, you know, more crucifixes and weird relics that are in the bathroom with him. And he's on his knees and he's slouched up against the wall with his hands kind of tucked against his chest. He had no external injuries. He was just 
dead. And so the police take Chris's body and the coroner comes in and does a report and it comes out that Chris died of natural causes. He died of a heart attack. And so when friends and family saw that that was his cause of death, they didn't buy it. They're like, I don't know how to describe what happened to him. But over the past seven days, Chris went from this happy, healthy, successful guy to a complete raving paranoid lunatic. And no one knows why. You know, it's, I mean, it's certainly possible that it was just a very poorly timed heart attack, you know, mixed in with someone having a psychotic break. Or some people say that he really was cursed by that woman in San Francisco and that that was the result. I mean, she said, you're gonna die within the week and he literally died within the week. And he described regularly over the phone to his friends and family as this was happening, these horrible experiences at night with these shadow beings in his room and it attacking him. I mean, it's just this crazy story that to this day leaves friends, family and investigators baffled. So I'd love to hear in the comments what you think happened to Christopher Case. Was this a you know natural death or was this something else? Let me know in the comments. I'll do my best to go through and respond to as many as I possibly can. So if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more videos like this one, I would encourage you to gently slap the like button and then subscribe to my channel and turn on all post notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly three to four uploads that look an awful lot like the video you just saw. If you want to get in touch with me, you can message me on Instagram. My handle is johnballin416. Also, I'm very active on TikTok where my handle is Mr. Ballin, so the same as my YouTube channel. I also go live on TikTok Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 p.m. Eastern. So I'd love to see you over there or on Instagram or on YouTube or all these different places. But no matter where I see you, I really appreciate your support. And that's going to do it, guys. Until next time, take care.